it is kind of a complicated thing to consider and uh, definitely get a lot of questions along these lines from folks calling me up down on campus or sending emails and, and I try to help. That doesn't mean I have all the answers, but I'm happy to visit with you about how we might find them for you. So one of the things I guess I find interesting is that there are lots of sources of information. There are, it seemed like, no shortage, especially in the modern internet era, where you can look up stuff and it'll say, it's this or it's that. And, um, and those, those sources can be helpful, but I'm going to show you that maybe they are not the best for you. You probably already know that's why you're sitting here, so <laughs> uh, I would guess. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions. So those of you who have a phone, and are willing to play along, I'd ask you to zip this QR code in there and we'll ask a couple of questions as we go along and, um, and we'll show you some of the results uh, if you play. If you don't, well then we, I, I'll hide them. <laughs> you won't be able to see them. <clears throat> Does everybody get that entered? I didn't put the other instructions on here. I discovered in the middle of the night while I woke up and I was thinking about, oh shoot, I didn't put that on there. So <laughs> there is a way you can text in on this, but I don't remember how you do it, just off of hand. But if you're able to read the QR code, then I have uh, a couple of different questions to start off with. So have been farming uh, or ranching for less than 10 years or are you ready to begin? Yes, no, or you're not sure. So did everybody answer that's going to? Because there's pretty, f just the three choices, not trying to overcomplicate it to begin with. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on, I guess you could see that most of you are yes. Have you owned or farmed a ranch for less than 10 years? Yes, no, or you're not sure. <clears throat> Okay, it looks like the same five people answered, thank you. Um, and you may, well, I'll reveal why I'm asking that question at the end, so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that input. So, I started off with saying there are a number of sources of information. You probably even have some ideas about how you go about calculating uh, costs and returns for your own place. Anybody got any, uh, any, any explanation as to why they find that a problem? Anybody want to volunteer why that's a challenge or what the challenge is? Well, I can wait, I guess. It may not be relevant to where we are or what we do. Okay, great. It may not be relevant, so it may, it may be an, exam, an example or a, or a number that has been developed for some other area and it may not, you're wondering whether it may not be appropriate for what you're up to. Good point. Anything else? I think the questions themselves were not a little confusing. So less than 10 years, you know you got an answer, but it's more than uh, Well, that's something else. <laughs> Great point. Well, you know, the university even makes information available, but to your point, right, it may not be a good fit for what you're up to, or it may not even be something that's addressing your specific enterprise. Well, anybody, anybody else thought of something that you would want to share as to why you find it challenging? In terms of calculating your own cost and returns, your break-even price. My husband loses his receipts. <laughs> well, Maybe we should talk to Clay about that, because it's, <laughs> but that can be a problem, keeping track of the information, certainly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Variability on a small scale, if you're not buying the bulk, so mm -hmm. prices change. So your costs are kind of up and down, and what you get to charge isn't necessarily up and down, is it? <laughs> Good point. 
So, you know, back to Jenny's question or point is, you know, or even organizing the information, whether it's a matter of putting the receipts diligently in a particular folder, keeping them so you can go back and, and uh, call them up when you need to, say at tax time or some other weird time of the year, like who would care about that? Only you have to file your taxes, so it becomes important at one point or another. Um, but if you want to answer the question of, of how uh, things fit together for your operation, you need good information, and the best information is usually your information because it fits what you're up to and it may follow those ups and downs as well as be specific to your activities. But I have uh, a number of other ideas about how it can be challenging. One of them can be terminology. Just even knowing what terms some ag economist with a funny mustache standing in front of the, of the room is actually meaning when he says costs and returns or expenses and revenue or whatever. I mean, those are accounting terms. They have very specific meanings. And one of the points would be if we're going to actually calculate something, we need to all be on the same page of what goes in what categories, right? Or what folder or what we even mean. So terminology can be a real challenge uh, to pulling that together. So in the hopes of trying to clarify at least one point, enterprises we talk about in agricultural economics as being an activity that results in a product available for sale. So if we're producing um, hay, it's pretty clear. We're selling baled hay usually, okay? But if we have a sheep operation, we might also not only have meat or lambs for meat, but we might also sell wool. Okay, so it can become complicated rather quickly. Or if we have a cow-calf operation, well, that probably means we sell calves, but it also probably means we have hay that we could sell. We might even have coal cows, right? Or coal bulls, or we might raise bulls for sale um, as a separate enterprise, or even bred heifers. I mean, it can be complicated rather quickly even in something we, everybody talks about, cow-calf in Wyoming, right? So, but if you have a farm, as I'm guessing some of you have, or, or hobby activities that you're trying to grow, or you're wondering whether you could grow and actually make money from, it's more clear that you have the segmentations, whether it's cut flowers and, um, and or maybe producing um, some kind of a vegetable crop or something like that that has a d discrete product we can do a lot of those things on the same property, right? And so those, each of those would be called an enterprise. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay. Oh, a question here yeah. in the front. Go ahead. What if the enterprises <laughs> take or add to each other? Okay, like sheep versus... Well, yeah, I mean, like... I mean, yeah, some, like, one <coughs> product may be used... Say cut product. flowers versus dried flowers or bulbs. Right? Those are three things that could come from the same activity. Yep. You mean like it's consumed by the other entities? Yeah, that's like what I mean. Ah. Raising livestock. So like a raise. Great example. To sell, mm -hmm. sell it to people, but I also raise it. To feed to your animals? Yeah, so mm -hmm. my hay operation isn't, yeah, my hay operation could be divided into more, to yes. two different enterprises. And you just have to keep track of the ins and outs of the, because the enterprises may overlap with each other. It's a great question you're asking, <laughs> and, the, and the answer is really straightforward, and you've already given it, that is, you need to keep track. How close of track has to do with what question you have, though, okay? So we're going to get into this, but, but I will repeat that. It depends on what answer it is you're looking for as a manager, okay? Because if you're wondering, and I think more in Wyoming should wonder about this question, how much I'm making on my hay versus how much I'm making on my weaned calf, I think a lot more people need to know because you'd be surprised at the answer. I've calculated it and, and the answer is surprising. Uh, so if you don't care, well, it's okay, you know? But if you care and you're looking for, well, you know, I'm about making money or I'm making, I want to know if I'm making a profit, then it matters and how close a track you're keeping on that is going to give you, you know, a more accurate answer, obviously. And it can vary one year to the next, because if you put fertilizer on only every two years, well, how do I allocate that as an example, right? Or if I have more water available, but I ran out this year. I mean, there's some things that change one year to the next, even when you're doing 
a commercial hay activity or cow-calf. So good question, Dave, thank you. All right, so just so we're, we're clear, I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So have you ever attempted to calculate this sort of cost and return for yourselves? Yes, no, or you're not sure? And I apologize, I took the QR code down that allows you to participate on the phone, but that's what these questions are. You guys came in late. <clears throat> One more brave soul who participated previously can go ahead and answer now. It's okay. Oh. Okay, thank you. So some of you have tried it, and we'll maybe draw from your experience here in frustration, perhaps. Um, but one of my first points is, looks like this, and that is that if you do file your taxes for agricultural purposes or even per, uh, for personal taxes, you usually pull your records together well enough at some point in the year to understand where, where things are all together. So we refer to that as an ag economy, ag economics term is the whole farm. We, we usually know where we are as a whole farm, right? Now, usually that means on a cash basis, and we'll argue about that a little bit later, but, but at least you have some feel for it. What a lot of people don't want to do is break that down into these enterprises. So this is a commercial ag example where we might have some kind of small grains. Uh, we may be growing corn. We might even have a livestock enterprise, okay? So this diagram is intended to say a couple of things. One is if we want to know whether we're making money on we'll call this hay, uh, you know, we have to actually be able to allocate the costs and returns accurately, like we've already said. And you're all shaking your head. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yep. Only some of the things we have to allocate are inconvenient. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the other point I want to make is that you'll notice there's not a line that goes off over here into the unknown. You don't get to just say, oh, I don't know where it goes. Well, Wait a minute, there's only three places it can go. So we have to allocate it. That gets to the accuracy question, Dave. We must allocate everything, even if it's hard. Can you give me an example of something that would be hard? Diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. Well, I just only put that in my tractor, so that should be easy, shouldn't it? <laughs> the tractor gets used for a lot of things. Oh, that's the problem, isn't it? And it's really awkward to start thinking about keeping track of the hours of what it's spending its time doing, isn't it? You must be an ag economist. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, our labor sometimes. Like the owner's labor. Sometimes. How about farm insurance? You know, fire insurance or rebuilding that one building that was falling down and how do we allocate that? But we use it for storing the tractor in that we use for lots of things, okay? So it doesn't take very long and you start thinking of things that are, that could be pretty expensive, but they need to be allocated. And so Dave, it's a great question you ask, but it's hard to come up with the answer. <laughs> I have some suggestions. Unfortunately, even commercial ag operators want this other category over here as well, that's hard. And, um, <clears throat> and would prefer to actually do it on a cash basis, because at least with diesel fuel, we know how much it is, right? It's a dollar amount for the year. And some of these other things may not actually have a, a total for the year to even know what to allocate. So we'll get into that a little bit more. But the point, Another point of that diagram is that we don't have profitability, say, at the cut flower level without also potentially having profitability at the whole farm level, right, for everything we're doing. That profitability is in there. Um, now, it's possible to lose money at the whole farm level because if something else is losing enough money, right, it overshadows the, the money you may be making in, in uh, raising some lambs for, for locker lambs or something. You see what I'm saying? So, so it is, but, but there is no free lunch. You actually need to allocate 
all of your costs and returns for the entire operation in order to figure out whether or not you have enterprise profitability. Okay, and so like we've just given the example more than once, but there may be one enterprise or one activity that's generating dollars of return in excess of costs or it's profitable, or there may be another that's losing money and on balance uh, at the whole farm level, we, we maybe really don't understand that relationship. And so that's another valuable point of breaking this out is that we can come to understand where is it we're making money, how much, and if we're losing any money to understand that as well. So one of the typical ways of organizing this is referred to as creating an enterprise budget. And so that's basically this business of allocating out things uh, that are at the whole farm level down to the enterprise or activity level for a period of time so that we understand where are we on a financial basis. And realistically, that, that activity is not all that complex. There is an example right here of how that would, there's only four <laughs> or five numbers, if you want to think about it, that we need. We need the cash returns and the cash costs. And then there's this other thing called non-cash and non uh, returns and non-cash costs, which, of course, that's just some AggieCon, who would need to know that stuff kind of number, and we get this enterprise returns over costs. That's all there is to it, just five numbers, that it would be just so easy if we could come up with them, <laughs> but it's not quite that easy. So let's dig into what we need to put in there. So we've talked about what the enterprise is already. Uh, enterprise returns are those things that we're generating in terms of dollars of income for that activity. So it's usually um, yield, how, you know, what we're harvesting in terms of pounds, or it could be stems if we're cutting flowers, or it could be um, bushels or some other measure of yield against the price that we're receiving across the period of time. Usually we're thinking about a year, but it could be, it could be a reason why you want to think about it in another period of time. But basically, that's what we're coming up with is what do we earn or what are we getting in the way of cash income from that activity. Similarly, enterprise costs are the costs that go into it. Um, and those um, will arise from either operating, which are more often referred to as cash costs, but the things that we're doing on a regular basis that vary based on how much of it we're doing. So if we have one acre of pumpkins, you know, it's, it's one acre of it, and that varies. Um, and we know maybe what that cost is for that particular acre, but if we have 10 acres or a, or a larger number, right, it goes up. And so that's the operating cost is going to vary based on the level of production, we call it, how many units of production we're engaged in. Everybody with me on that? Because this is really important. <laughs> we should have a test here already. But this ownership cost, that's the one day that we're really kind of sweating, because what would that be? Anybody have an idea? Include your um, mortgage? It could, yes. So ownership, that's, that's the thing that immediately comes to mind, but it's basically all of these non-cash costs, okay? And so um, it may be interest we're paying, it may be, um, it could be farm insurance, as I used as an example. It could be a host of other things that are non-cash. The one people nobody wants to nobody the one that nobody wants to talk about is depreciation, and we'll get there. But it's it's a non-cash cost, right? We don't write a check uh, for depreciation costs. It could also include things like changes in inventories. Think if you're thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me. Well, if you bought fertilizer, for example, it's been in the shed since last season and we're going to use it this spring, guess what? That's not bought in this calendar year. There's no check being written in this calendar year, so it's a non-cash cost, isn't it? We're using something that was on hand. That's also part of what we're trying to account for. Why would we care? Anybody have an idea why we would care about that? Because if we're going to talk about profit, this is one of these 
ag account or accounting things actually, but ag economists get excited about it too. If we're going to talk about profit, what we really mean is, is there anything left after we've covered everything, right? Everything. Not just some of the things, not just the cash, but everything. So if we're using a tractor we bought three years ago and it's still running, we didn't need to buy a tractor this year. We don't have to assign the cost of a tractor this year to our crop, do we? You see? Or maybe we should because we're still using that tractor, you see? We don't expense the tractor in the year we buy it. You follow me? We also didn't expense the fertilizer that I just gave the example of against last year's hay or against last year's pumpkin uh, production. Why? Because we didn't use it up, you see? But that means we have to know how much it costs and apply it to this next year's pumpkin production or corn or whatever else we're pr producing. So this ownership cost includes all of that kind of non-cash in general cost that we need to keep track of in order to be able to establish whether we've earned a profit or not. That's, well, that's one of the biggest reasons why it's complicated or difficult or we don't really want to do it. We just worry about cash, <laughs> right? Because it's complicated. So here's some of the more common operating costs. You guys all know this because we're writing checks as we're doing this stuff throughout the year. So whether it's seed or fertilizer or other kinds of things we call operating inputs. Uh, fuel is pretty obvious and lube, repair and maintenance, so on our machinery and equipment. Um, or it could be on our irrigation system or other kinds of things, repair and maintenance there, labor. Uh, Jenny brought up, but it gets tricky if it's my labor as the owner versus I'm paying a hired person, you know, to help on weekends or whatever it might be, as well as interest on our operating input. So if we borrow money from a bank to actually allow us to cover these costs during the operating year, the interest on that would also be something we would assign under our operating cost. Everybody with me? This is the easy one. <laughs> it's the next one that's harder. The Oh, I go through these. Okay, so I, I don't know how much time we need to spend on this, but basically, you know, these items that we're buying to actually make the production of the crop or, or it could be a livestock enterprise. We may be buying vaccines or purchasing hay to feed our, our um, stalker animals or however we may be doing that with, with animals. Uh, in production could be a chicken enterprise, right? It, all of these things require inputs as we do them. Uh, fuel and lube, um, <clears throat> so whatever, whatever it might be, fuel for tractors are more obvious, but fuels for pickups that we're running to town to get parts or buy the seed and haul back and haul, uh, pull the trailer to haul animals, that gets a little more nebulous, right? Because we may have pulled the trailer in to get fertilizer, we brought that back, but then now we're also hauling animals and so there's mixing it up, right? The miles being used for that pickup and or the fuel is becoming um, less clear as we start thinking about a particular uh, enterprise or another. So uh, again, uh, back to Dave's point and what I said to him then is it depends on how close you want to get. I can show you some ways in a whole farm setting that you might want to use to allocate this stuff, but obviously if you want to know precisely, you can keep track of every single mile, uh, which is onerous, right? It's just sort of unrealistic. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, you can skip this if you want, but like, if I, so I, I've got a hay meadow, and I, if I, um, if I'm going to sell, like I have what my costs are to, for, to produce a, a round bale, one round bale, and I'm going <coughs> to sell, bale to you for, for one price, am I like selling it to my, to my cow operation at my cost? Do you keep track of that or no? So the answer is yes, you should. If you can, so the, the straight up answer is why should your calves get to eat that bale or your cows get to eat that bale cheaper than your, that your neighbor paid you to buy it, you know? It would be like a missed opportunity, right? Because your other option is to sell the hay and not have the livestock. Uh -huh. in part so so you should charge yourself the same as what you can get for it on the open market 
you, you, and that may not actually cover all your costs, Dave. Huh? But you don't know yet because you haven't calculated your cost of production. And that's where we're headed with this. Just because you sold it to your neighbor and this is what everybody in the valley is charging doesn't mean that that's covering your break-even cost, believe it or not. But yes, if you're going to sell it to your cow-calf enterprise, you should be charging what at least that price. And yes, your cow-calf enterprise may struggle to cover that cost. Hmm, that might be good to know, mightn't it? Because otherwise, or Without that knowledge, whatever price you get for your calves is a good price. Because it's positive as opposed to paying somebody to take it away, right? You think I'm joking, but people don't know. They don't know. And obviously it's important if you want to make sure that you're covering your cost to know what your costs are, okay? So yes, you should know at least what your cash costs are for transferring that uh, to your other a enterprise activities. It could be horses, it could be bulls, I, you know, I don't care, but you shouldn't be giving it to them and selling, you know, transferring it at some lower price. How could you justify that? Because you're losing money then, right? <clears throat> if, you're do if you're making that transfer at, at under your cost of production, you're losing money. When you're selling it to yourself at that, I mean, that, not, that's not usually people's objective, okay? Some people will do that and they can get, it's okay as long as you know what you're up to, but it's not, uh, it's not being in business to make a profit. It doesn't have a profit motive involved in that level of, uh, of that decision making, okay? So that's a good question, because I mean, it's something people struggle with. Okay, so moving forward, we have the repair and maintenance stuff we said is basically covering Obviously parts, but if we're hiring somebody to, you know, make the baler work again, if it need, takes a new tire, well, we, you know, uh, we need to think about what are the, what are the uh, costs tied to that. If we have to take it, to take the machine in town, or if we have to pay somebody to come out, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, different kinds of costs. And if you're actually making a repair that can last for multiple years you may want to think about allocating that forward. So, I don't know how much to go into this. <laughs> An example is, well, if you blew up the motor in the tractor and you really need it to go, and somebody comes out, puts it on a trailer, takes it in, puts a new ba uh, motor in there and brings it back, it's a way of making that tractor last a lot longer than one more season. Charging the motor against this year's pumpkin crop would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Kind of like buying the tractor in the first place and charging it all against this year's crops, whatever they might be. Everybody with me on that? So we're, you know, we want to think about major repairs or something that gives life back to the machine that might extend for multiple years. You want to think about that and potentially using a depreciation method to allocate it. Um, but there are a lot of, of other charges that go with repair and maintenance besides just parts. So there could be labor or there could be transportation costs as I was trying to explain. So, you know, thinking about that and how do you accomplish those uh, repairs are kind of important. Labor, obviously, would refer to anybody we're hiring to help accomplish the work, and that's pretty straightforward. But if there's, uh, you know, the owner-operator is involved, or if there are other family members are involved, how they're paid, you know, um, as an example, hired labor, if you pay them a cash wage per hour, it's pretty straightforward. But what if they get room and board, you know, get uh, housing on the place? Or what if they get half a beef a year? Or what if they get to use a pickup, right? There's a lot of things that are common, common and customary in how we pay labor in this state that are not so obvious, and they're probably not included when we say hired labor. You know, sometimes they get utilities covered in the house, including the phone, and I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. And those would be important costs that add up to, well, what's the cost of the labor, okay? So, should be included to get to an accurate estimate of what the labor costs are. We touched on interest already, but basically if we're borrowing money from, a, from some other source to cover some of those costs during the year for operating inputs, the cost of the interest um, would be a, another operating cost that should be included in order to get to our cash costs for the year. Question about any of that? Well, I guess the kids, I mean, I was being funny, but I mean, 
you actually should, you're not paying them, you just, you give them clothes and food, you should come up with some kind of figure, huh? Well, what if they didn't do it? I could ask you. Oh, yeah. That's now what? You have to Does the it. enterprise still happen? Probably not. <laughs> now, they may not be as skilled as your tractor driver, and so you may not want to charge, you know, a full, you know, tractor driver price or somebody that's getting housing on your place or however you're working that. But they should get charged. I mean, something should go against uh, the enterprise in terms of what the co costs are to make it happen. Because it wouldn't probably, you don't probably don't do it as timely. If not, there may be pieces of it that fall apart if you don't have the help. So it's a good question. Okay, ownership costs. And again, this is the stuff that tends to be more challenging for folks not only to understand, but in order to, under, to figure out a way to handle it consistently on your place and, and how you're charging it. So again, these are the what are typically non-cash costs, although some of them can be cash in nature. Taxes being one of those. You're paying personal property tax on the items that you're using for farming it's really obvious that it's a cash cost when you write the check to pay the, right? You're writing the check to pay the property tax. No problem, you know what it is. And if you have only one enterprise, well, it can be easily assigned. But what if you have a cow-calf enterprise and you have a hay enterprise? Small or large, it doesn't matter how much goes to which, you see? Because the land is being used maybe for, for both and sometimes of the year and only for one at other times in the year. And so, how would you allocate it? Anybody got an idea? This is why we don't do it, huh? <laughs> I understand. You could, could take all the total costs in the year and have some sort of proportion added to both. It may be a little arbitrary, but somewhere you can start. Better than nothing, though. I'm with you. Okay, that's one way. Take your total cash costs. We've just gone through those. Those are pretty obvious. Total cash costs and use that proportion to assign property tax. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is say units of production. So if I have 20 acres of hay or if I have 200 acres of hay and I've got 10 cows or 2,000 cows, whatever, you could take those units and that adds up to a total and use a similar proportion as another way if you thought it was fair. Back to Dave's point, he asked early on, he was hitting it pretty hard right away, is, you, you know, it depends on how closely you want it, the answer to be, so for your management decision input, okay? There's no sense spending hours and hours and hours tracking, you know, some kind of specific vehicle hour, uh, miles or tractor hours or anything, unless you really need to know that, that closely when we can use a rule of thumb and maybe get pretty close, okay? <clears throat> we could actually go through and, and estimate our other non-cash costs and take total costs as another way of totaling it up and using that proportion to assign, okay? But taxes are one of those categories of ownership costs because again, it covers stuff that can be used that is not clear that it varies by production. Remember what I said, operating costs vary by the level of production. So if we have 10 acres or 100 acres of pumpkins, it's gonna vary. This doesn't vary. If we've got 100 acres, you pay the same property tax. So it's not actually tied to, to the land per se, it's the, or well, a portion of it maybe, all right? The property tax doesn't vary by, by how many tons or, or how many pumpkins are harvest, you see? It, it, it is a fixed cost, essentially. And that's another way of referring to these. Ownership cost often is fixed cost. It doesn't vary throughout the year or by level of production. Housing is another one of those that some people will say, well, I don't put my, my uh, equipment in a shed. Okay, well, you know, you may not have machinery sheds, you may not have a barn, but, but that's what comes to mind first is the buildings that we may, may be using for various aspects of our operation. But if we don't put our machinery in, if we don't have shelter for our animals, they may not produce as well, so we're paying one way or another. But this is generally meaning machinery cost, and we're assigning a housing charge to the use of our machinery. Okay? 
Question about that? But if we have buildings, well, it's kind of hard to allocate it, just like taxes we talked about, right? And if it's buildings that are only for livestock, we cab in there or we, you know, we, we do branding in there or some other kinds of stuff we do in there, or if it's tied only to you know, housing our fertilizer and seed for our crop activities, well then it's really clear where we should assign it, and we should assign it accordingly, right? If it's for, if we use it to store a grain, for example, and it's for livestock feed, well then we assign it all to the livestock enterprise. Or if we have more than one of those, we have to figure out how to split that. Everybody follow me on that? I mean, we're not, it's not like magic, it's just, but it has to make sense to your situation, okay? Insurance, another one of those that can be a fairly expensive uh, sort of item. We all probably carry it. How do you allocate it? Well, again, one of these rules of thumb is a pretty handy way to do it. If you know a better way, uh, so if it was all tied to insuring only buildings, for example, and you knew on your insurance policy that the buildings were such and such an amount and that was only used for the livestock, well, you could assign that portion to the livestock. If other parts of it were for the machinery and that's for cropping, see, sometimes it's obvious. Other times you wouldn't know. Go ahead. My insurance, I guess, is all like through personal at this point. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I had hoped to have you know, separate farm insurance and whatever, but right now it's all together. And like I would imagine 90% of that is for the two houses that are on the property, and then the rest is for our outbuildings and whatever, you know. So the, the cost of the houses themselves, does that go against this at all? Or is that Well, that's a whole other can of spinach. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, though. Okay, so my, my accounting uh, training and my ag econ training tells me that although some people want to mix that in there, uh, I will argue that that's the operator uh, return on operator labor and management. That's what I call it. What, what am I meaning? Well, if I participate in this activity, whatever, or set of activities, I'm not probably drawing a wage. I'm paying for my housing. I'm paying for the fuel in the pickup. I'm, right, I'm covering my whatever else, food bill, et cetera, right? And so that's my take in terms of cash, but I'm also getting to live in the house, so that's another, that's another return to me. So I'm getting it either as a wage or, and that's the easiest way to just think about it as a total, but there is management. So we go back to Dave's question is, what if I wasn't the guy doing the labor? Well, I might still need to be making decisions about what's going on. So there is a portion that's reasonable to think about being assigned to my management capacity. If I'm, if I'm just a hired man, I might not know which crop to plant in this field or when to turn the water on or turn it off, right? I might have to hire a manager who's capable of making those decisions. So when I say owner labor and management, that's the two things I'm thinking about. And it's reasonable to get something out of it. Obviously, we wouldn't do it. If we, if we didn't get something out of it, the question is how to value that. <laughs> and since we don't pay ourselves a wage, well, it's pretty hard to value it, except by these means we're using. And we will get to the number that is the number, and that's what we get. <clears throat> Whether we take it as cash or not, that's the return. So, great question. And, um, and so insurance on your home, I wouldn't, I mean, it's not, it's not to do with the farm or the ranch. That, sh in my books, should stand on its own and cover its own cost at the very least. Even if I sell some kind of a funny formula in between my <laughs> enterprises, it should stand on its own as being either profitable or not. And that's where I want to get to. I said that about profit a little while ago. Everything all counted in there, right? So whether it's cash or not, or insurance that may cover some other things that are part of what we're up to, we need to get it in there. Uh, this is just going to be counted against my time and effort going in. It's a little bit different way of accounting for it. Well, this is the one that causes most people the heartburn, is depreciation. Anybody, anybody, uh, yeah, I don't know how to, go. <laughs> I 
I always try to do a better job with this every time I get the chance, but I, I don't know if I'm getting any better or not. So I've already given you a couple of examples, but the, the, main, the biggest one that works for me is if I buy a tractor and it lasts. I mean, it's, obviously it lasts. If I buy a bull, it usually lasts more than one breeding season. Now, if it died, I probably should charge it off all against this year. But if it lasts for the typical three years, well, each year should have a third of the bull's cost assigned, right? Well, what about salvage value? Somebody usually brings up. I'm going to help you with that. So what if I sell the bull after I'm done with it for the three years, right? Well, that's something that comes back to me. So we take that off that initial cost and we allocate the remaining portion. Well, how much is that when you're doing it, see, because you don't know till it's done. And so you have to make estimates. And you say, well, you're making something up. Yeah, because we don't know. But the bigger risk is not to assign it at all, isn't it? Say the bull got used for free? Huh. Go to the neighbors and try that. See how that works, right? <laughs> I'll bet they have something to say that's not free either. So you see, uh, using the neighbor's tractor is another great example. You're, they're not going to let you do it for free. So that's what we're trying to do with depreciation, is to allocate the value or the useful life, or the, another way to think about it, is the contribution that that item makes to each year's per crop or livestock production. Does that make sense? And so it's, it's non-cash. We're making estimates based on what we see as the, uh, the estimated salvage value and, and how long we think it's going to last in order to better understand what it's costing us today or for this year's pumpkin crop or corn crop or whatever it is. So uh, we want to do that with all those items that have value that last more than just a single season. So buildings are pretty obvious vehicles, other kinds of machinery and equipment. Um, but in the case of bulls or cows, you know, those kind of livestock that last, those also have this kind of a component to it. We want to assign a cost so that when we say we're selling this many calves this year from these cows and these bulls we were carrying, we can figure out what is the profit or the level of return for this year's calf crop on a, on a per calf basis or on a per pound basis is another way to calculate it. So is everybody with me? We're not making it up just because the IRS says something about depreciation, okay? That actually is a completely different number, believe it or not. It has nothing to do with management. What, I, what the IRS allows for tax purposes is not the same as the depreciation uh, that I'm talking about for management purposes so that we, we actually understand what we've got into it and what, what returns we're expecting to get back. Everybody with me? <coughs> okay, long-term interest. So if we're borrowing money for the mortgage, uh, Dave, or if we're buying uh, machinery and equipment, those kind of long, those loans that go with this class of, uh, or if we built a new building or, or repaired an old building substantially, if we had to borrow money to do that, the interest charges are another one of those costs that we would need to assign to our enterprises. Okay, and those are those are checks we have to write out. So we and and you'll notice it's interest. I didn't say anything about principal, and we could get into an argument about that. But I suspect you guys don't want to hear about it because um, it it also is kind of confusing. But interest is the cost of using the capital that we borrowed. And so that's a legitimate as assignment to our non-cash cost, or in this case, it's cash cost, but our ownership cost over time, okay? So another one of these questions. <laughs> Which enterprise uh, costs and returns issue do you find most challenging? So now I'm listing several after having walked through it. Is it terminology? Is it about selecting the right approach for either for analysis or for allocation? Is it interpreting the results, organizing the information or the data, comparing one enterprise to others, 
something we haven't talked about yet, it's not listed. What do you think? I think you're also allowed to choose more than one choice on this question. <laughs> I forget, I think I remember to set it up that way. <clears throat> Cool, we have eight answers already. That's great. <laughs> okay, since we spent most of the time talking about classifying costs and returns, I'm glad that's the part you found most challenging. <laughs> okay, and, and that probably is, is one of the more common answers we get. Uh, interpreting the results or organizing the data or other, other common answers people give. And I, I'm sympathetic. I'd, I hope I haven't made you feel like I don't understand. I mean, we, we do a little, uh, little small farm activities ourselves at our place, and it's, it's challenging to think about what should go in there, especially when it comes down to really understanding what the cost is that we need to know to calculate break-even. Okay, so uh, knowing your numbers are, are obviously going to give you the best answers to make a, choice, a decision about what should you charge if it's a matter of uh, the price, or at least knowing what your returns are if you're not actually selling it out to someone else. <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So we have created a tool. Um, we have, there are spreadsheets you can get to actually help you walk through this, but again, they may not apply to activities that you're involved in. Um, and again, the way that that tool would go about it is basically assigning the returns and the expenses in order at both cash and non-cash um, in order to get to a bottom line. And that can be definitely be challenging. We have created uh, a tool specifically to help you walk through that. Uh, it is available on the website that it's on the handout that I gave you at rightrisk.org. And it's no cost to you if you want to download and try to use it. It uh, allows you to enter these cash and non-cash costs and returns. Uh, once you've done that, it will calculate break-even price and break-even yield. And I didn't put up a bunch of screens. I could, I, <clears throat> if I had more time, but I was smart. I didn't put them in here. These other slides to help describe how the tool works. But there is a guide online that you can also download that gives you uh, explanation of what goes into every blank. So it's many of the things we've talked about here. It has a couple of examples also that shows you how to put the numbers, where the, uh, the totals that come out, and then, and then actually provides you with the results and explains what those results mean. Um, but it goes beyond just uh, discrete numbers, okay? So it includes a component so it allows you to evaluate risk. Because as you started off, right, it can vary year to year as what our costs are, as well as what we might be able to get by charging the neighbor for our hay, Dave. <laughs> right? Those costs and returns might vary. That's what we would expect. Ca calculating just one number is, one, is, and if we do it at this time of year, thinking about we're going to sell hay in July, well, it might be different by then. So a tool like this can allow us to put in some estimates. We can go back and rejigger it if the values you know, for fertilizer or something else might change. But it also, because it incorporates risks, allow us to make an estimate of what things are. And it'll give you a distribution around that. So depending on what we put in there is the most likely value, as well as what we think is reasonable high and low, it'll, say, it'll give us a distribution and assign probabilities to the numbers on the curve. So if it's a matter of total returns, we can look that up by uh, using our mouse in the tool and actually reads off the probabilities of how likely those total returns are. But it also does it with break-even analysis. So it, it gives us an estimate of how likely it is to break even at a specific price. So if we said $65, a traditional price for alfalfa, which is of course not something to talk about these days, uh, the likelihood of breaking even on that's pretty darn low. Why? Well, because costs are a lot higher today. We could also charge more, so that's helpful. But, right, a couple hundred dollars might be more like in the ballpark, given the power, high-powered equipment we use and, and a number of other input costs. 
So it'll give us a break, it'll give us a probability of breaking even at a specific price. Or if we flip that around and hold price constant, it'll show us how likely we are to break even at a particular yield. So if we are planning on a ton and a half per acre for meadow hay, for example, or if we're thinking about five tons an acre uh, for alfalfa, although if you're out on a ranch, that might be kind of hard to hit that uh, on a farm. It's maybe on the low end. Okay, and so obviously this varies situation by situation, but it'll give you probabilities of breaking even given your assumptions. It's a very powerful tool, and again, the, the guide and the examples are intended to try to help you walk through that. It is only one of several tools that we've created, um, and so this is a little bit of an advertisement. They're all available to help you if you want to take a look at them. They all have different guides and they have examples and so on and so forth. We have a number of different uh, fact sheets or, or bulletins out there on the table that show the use of some of these tools if you're interested, but all of it is online. So you can download all of what I'm saying and you can look at all of it, you can read it, you can uh, try these out. Um, and I guess I would encourage you to do so if you are struggling with certain management decisions. Uh, but you can also contact me down on campus and I would try to help you if you have questions specific to to the use of those or the application. But I have to end now so that you can all go to lunch here in a couple of minutes. I have a point for questions at the very end, but was this presentation uh, helpful to you, useful to you? You can agree, you can completely agree, you can be kind of unsure there in the middle, uh, or there's some other choices. I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend that you spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, another question is, is there something out of this that you might try to apl in, apply or try to use? So whether you're thinking about looking something up on the website, actually trying one of these, maybe picking up one of those bulletins, something that you might uh, actually think about applying out of what we've talked about today, you can agree disagree, completely disagree, it's okay with me. <laughs> okay, thank you for those responses. Now to the question I asked up front. <laughs> and what's paying for my travel to be here is this program called the, the Growing uh, Beginning Farmers and Ranchers Program in Wyoming is a federal grant we were able to, to um, get a couple years back. It's primarily, you may have seen it in the news, it's been written up in the roundup a few different times, but it's a program where we're putting interns out on farms and ranches around the state to learn more about how to participate in this thing we call agriculture. If they don't have that experience, like I asked up front, then that's how they're gaining some experience. They don't have to be a student. We've had veterans go through this that have come back and are looking for opportunities, you know, to get connected in agriculture. Uh, but we have a number of students that have also been through it. Uh, if you're interested, we have more information out there, but it's also helping us to develop some of these risk management tools, as well as another topic I didn't mention at all today, but that's transition planning. So transitioning to the next generation and, and trying to give people that may want to come back to the farm or ranch a chance to better understand what some of the ins and outs are, as well as the older generation that's retiring and how to you know, engage in the communication, how to set up some of those transitioning relationships. So this program is covering the cost and I appreciate you sitting in. Are there any final questions that I might try to address? I've covered a lot and I apologize, I went pretty fast, but hopefully I've covered some of the terminology things and some of those basic kinds of questions probably more effective than me getting out the tool and waving my hands and saying, well, what if we try this and what do we do that? Because usually the questions are a little more basic. So hopefully I've given you a few uh, pointers on that. But if you, again, if you have questions, I'll be around the rest of the day. If you want to contact me down on campus, I'd be happy to visit with you. With that, thank you for your time. Thank you.